We're done with mainstream media. It's dull. It's boring. You can't say anything or do anything. You get edited. So we're making our own. This series is called Stepping Up. This is issue number one. And joining me for the first chat, not an interview, it's a conversation, is somebody who I first met deep in the bowels of the European Parliament back in the 1990s when he was the editor of the Today programme. I mean, that Remainist Central London organisation. Also, I think fair to say, Rod Little, a long-term member of the Labour Party. 37 years. Now prolific columnist, yeah. controversialist. And it's odd because when I first met you down in, 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 in the, the, as I say, literally the bowels of the it European was, Parliament, yeah, yeah. Uh, it would have been 2001, I it think. Was. Um, you were editing the Today programme and for all of your background, I would have thought that you ticked the boxes mm. of being a Remain. Oh. And yet you've stepped up. You've kind of, <laughs> I mean, well, you have stepped up. But even then, even then, back when I met you, that was a trip to the, to, to the Brussels office, yeah. which we at the Today programme uh, did not respect. We had no time for the Brussels office. Um, and we went there and we put up referendum party posters on the walls. Uh, we, we, we acted as sort of teenage vandals and we took the mickey out of them, uh, out of the BBC correspondence office, which seemed to me just to be an office which broadcasted Brussels propaganda without filter. And at that time, well, we, we got into a lot of trouble for it as well as the Today programme. Um, but <laughs> if you just remember the time, this idea of BBC partiality, the Brussels correspondent at the time, one of them was, I think, Angus Roxburgh. Yes, I remember. Uh, he, did a, he wrote a book about some of the right-wing parties in, in, in the European Union. Mm. Do you know what it was called? Preachers of hate, <laughs> and it, impartial. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. and I would mention this to people at the BBC, I'd say, how is that? Well, they are fascists. <laughs> we were talking about Pim Fortain. He was as far from he was a fascist. A very, I mean, a, a lot of people watching this won't remember him, but I mean, no. this was a, he was a, sort of a, a cultural figure in the yeah. Netherlands yeah. Um, and just stood up and said, we've got to really start to think about what's going on yeah, with our communities right. and immigration yeah. and was killed in the street. And was killed in the street, yeah. I, and, um, but it was okay for the BBC at that point to, to call them preachers of hate. And this was all at the time when a friend of yours, I think, uh, Lord Pearson of Rannoch, mm suddenly started looking at the BBC and counting up how many pro-European Union people there were on it and how many Eurosceptics there were still on doing it. it he's still doing 20 it. years on, Lord Pearson is still doing well, it. Well, here's to Lord you Pearson. Know, I agree with that. <laughs> he, I mean, Rod, it's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to the BBC because I do think, actually, yeah. it plays a pretty important central Massive role part. in this country in yeah. terms of how we get news, how we assess yeah. news. Uh, but I was fascinated by this book. The gr I mean, Betrayal. Rod Little <laughs> has said the great betrayal. Is this not incendiary language, it's, Mr. Little? Well, I'm afraid I've poisoned the well of democracy. Are you fermenting debate. riots? I'm fermenting riots. Discontent. Uh, if, if I had known when I was writing that book that Jess Phillips might get attacked in the street, I wouldn't have written it, no, you know. No, uh, no. Well, uh, you cannot talk about what has happened with Brexit without using the word betrayal. <laughs> it, is, it has been a, an enormous betrayal on the part of uh, Parliament. Uh, and also the various non-elected manifestations of the liberal elite. See, There's this, a lot of see, this interests me because when that result came through, night of the 23rd of June, and it, for me it was the end of a very long road, Yeah, I'd sunk into a deep gloom, <laughs> convinced myself we'd probably lose, but it was almost like a mental preparation for yeah. whatever was to come. But, you know, I was up. I mean, every waking minute of that evening from the Sunderland result, my God, you know, maybe we're going to do it too. And then at about sort of 10 to 4, 10 past that sort of period in the morning, it became clear that actually we were going to win. Yeah. And you were awoken, as you say, in this book at 5 a.m. By your wife. Yes. By your wife to be told the news. And more astonishingly, I thought that Michael Gove and Boris Johnson had gone to bed. Yes. I woke up the next morning looking bewildered. Yes, and not happy. No, it didn't look happy. It was. I mean, that was bewildering. But I have to say that next day in London was an extraordinary day and I the mixed reactions I were getting were quite something. Do you know I, I was one of the happiest days of my life was a Sunday we were staying with friends in Dulwich 
which is remains in, in the central. <laughs> and I took the dog for a walk in Dulwich Park, and I, as I was going on, I made up this song called "We Voted to Leave." You better not grieve. We've and, and people were going, "It's a very bad thing." <laughs> and and my dog was with me, and my dog's called Jesse. But I thought I'd really annoy them, so I said. Farage, come here, come here. <laughs> <laughs> and the people, you haven't really called that dog up with that fascist. And I, it was just a most wonderful day. But Schadenfreude is only good for so long. But the interesting thing about this book is, okay, Gove was bemused by it all, as was Boris. Yeah. I was, I was thrilled, and had no idea what to do. I was thrilled. Uh, Cameron had decided to take a walk. Yeah, uh, you know, walk the plank, and probably rightly so in many ways, because yeah. he hadn't stayed yeah. neutral. Yeah. Uh, and and but there was a feeling, and even from the Remain side, there was a public acceptance that yes. this had happened, yes. that the battle lines had been clear, yes. that there was a majority of about 1.4 million, yeah, clearly, yeah. which isn't bad, it. not bad, and that it was going to happen. Mm. And if you look at interviews now of a lot of the leading protagonists today, either for absolute revocation of Article 50 or a second referendum. It's them in the days following saying we accept it, it's got to happen. And With yes, a few exceptions. Yes, there was Anna some. Subri. Well, 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 we don't even. Now, David can, Lammy. Isn't Subri doing well? <laughs> now, now can, can you tell me how a woman leading a party that is hovering at around about 0% in the polls gets wall-to-wall -wall BBC incredible. coverage, in fact everywhere? Because she is a hero to them. Uh, I remember an, uh, an article by David Aronovich um, in which he, he named his heroes and Anna Subri, brave, brave. It's brave to do... Well, it takes all sorts. It takes all sorts. But sort. you say in this book, and it's, by the way, it's a good book, quick read, and, 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 and that's a good thing. Uh, you can flick through this in a couple of hours you on the airplane, yeah, and yeah. that's a good thing. But you say in this book that actually the very next day that they, you call them they in the book, mm won't let it happen. Yes. Did you really believe that? Yes, without, well, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was the looks on the faces of, of Mr. Dimbleby and the, the correspondence in the, I mean, if you want to compare it with, for example, when Barack Obama won the US election. Oh, <laughs> the second coming of the, the Lord. second coming yes. of the Lord. And, yes. the, the, you know, there yeah. was a palpable, yes. they were absolutely hacked off. Um, and I just, I just thought they won't let it happen. I didn't know quite then what the process would be by which they wouldn't let it happen. But the process began by changing the narrative. Now uh, this, I found, this I found very interesting. You, when I read this, you reminded me of something that I think I'd forgotten, which is during the referendum campaign, it was leave or remain. Yeah. Quite simple. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Quite simple. Yes. And leave was shocking and dreadful because leave meant we'd leave the single market. Yeah. And leave meant we'd leave the customs union. Indeed. And leave meant all these dreadful things, uh, they should be the terrors of the earth, would happen to us. And you point out in here, quite right, that within days of the result, they'd redefine leave. Yes, that's right. As soft Brexit. Soft Brexit. Good Brexit. Soft Brexit, good Brexit. Hard Brexit. Bad that's Brexit. right. So that was the start of it. Um, and that was, that was almost immediate. <laughs> it was almost immediate. Um, and a lot of the people who were leavers didn't know what the hell they were talking about. What is this soft? I don't quite know what this is. But the, but the other narrative that was changed was one which was there all the way through the, through the referendum campaign, which was, and, and it's the way by which I think the Remainers have been able to convince themselves and the world that what they're doing isn't anti-democratic, it's democratic, which is that these leavers didn't know what they were voting for. Bit thick. Level of condescension. Level of condescension. Yeah. But this is important. This is important because this is how they justify to themselves. And racist. Now, you and I both know that whenever we go on a BBC television programme, at some point, even if we were talking about bringing up dogs or, or cuisine, you would be saying, well, what do you say about your racist past? You would have some fishwife yelling at you about racism. It is the, it is the default position of the BBC. Mind you, you were in the Labour Party. 
yes. which arguably today is a racist party. Oh, well, of course it is. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, one of the reasons I left, uh, well, the main reason I left, um, but, they, they, but what they needed to do in order to change that narrative was to convince themselves that the people who had voted dem uh, leave and the process by which they voted leave was not itself democratic, which is obviously absurd. And they came up with so many reasons for this, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, there wasn't a majority in favour of leave because not everybody voted. Yeah. Well, no, they never do. <laughs> but it's just these aren't Sally arguments. But they, they've been very, very important. And, you know, let's give credit to Lammy and Subri. Day one, June the 24th, David Lammy, let's just stop this now. Yeah. <laughs> it was a vote, yeah. you fucking idiot. But there, <laughs> but there are some clever people behind them. And there are some clever because people. Because if you think about this yeah. change of language, big money behind you them. Know, and even the use of people's vote. You know, well, we had yes, the people's vote. Right. But, but, it, but it's quite clever branding. What voted first time yeah. around? Yeah, no, no, but it's quite clever branding. I mean, I, I want to get back to they. They. Is yes. they. I mean, are we talking about big international capital, or are we being conspiratorial in suggesting that? Who's behind all of this? Well, I think there is big international capital, and, you know, um, an awful lot of the studies done towards, as you will remember, towards the end of the campaign, of the referendum campaign, by Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Just, Goldman Sachs said that Scotland would have its own currency by September. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, how do you trust these people? But what, what I really meant by they was, um, and I think this is the interesting thing about the Remain demographic as well, which has been far less talked about than the Leave demographic, but is more interesting. Um, there's that small part of the Remain demographic which is in an absolute echo chamber. So the civil service, um, the judiciary, the BBC, um, Parliament, <laughs> Parliament. Uh, so you have those four against you all the way along. And it's a powerful combination. And, and I mean, the, the, the civil service effectively did the negotiations for us. Well, this is where, yeah, I mean, David Davis thought he was the Brexit yeah, secretary right. and produced a white paper to which Mrs. May said, well, this is jolly interesting, David, but old Ollie Robbins, he's produced a real yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and of course, also, I mean, when they went... How much blame does she, how much blame goes on her? Massive blame, um, well, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, the Conservative Party should not have elected as a leader someone who was for, for Remain. I mean, if you go into these negotiations with your opponents knowing that you do not believe in the outcome, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's... it's bound to fail. Um, it was once said of her that she's the sort of negotiator who would come out of DFS with a full price sofa. I mean, that sounds <laughs> to me about right. Um, so she's not very good at negotiating. She seeded the sequencing of the negotiations terribly badly um, uh, in that we were given this massive bill which seems to have been written down on a piece of paper, you know, made up, entirely made up bill. Um, and went along with it, and then went along with the sequencing, which is, we are not going to talk about anything that you want, Britain, until we've got what we want. I mean, That's right. Yeah, no, no, I, Rod, I'm very struck. And then the election. I'm very struck with all of this, that actually, you know, if we do sign off on, they call it the deal, yeah. the withdrawal agreement. It's not as a new EU treaty. It's very yeah. important that we yes. get that point yes. established. Yes. But I'm very, I'm very certain of one thing, that we do all of that, and the next phase relies completely on their goodwill. It is like putting your head in a crocodile's mouth and hoping it is, it that he's is. going to be nice to you. Yeah. What about the Labour Party? I mean, we talk about the, we talk about May, and, and I mean, the Labour Party finished up in 2017 in the general election. She called, did very badly for reasons that we understand. Corbyn actually surprised all of us. Yeah. There, there was a burst of energy. Didn't surprise me, mate. Because he's um, an old because he's an old campaigner, or because. Uh, I get outside Westminster, I know you do as well, I mean, and I think the odium that is poured upon Corbyn um, uh, doesn't have much of an effect in certain parts of the country, particularly the north. I don't think he was any less popular up north than, for example, uh, Ed Miliband, possibly more so. Um, 
and I wrote a piece for The Spectator when May called that election and said Labour will gain seats. You were one of the few that saw that. Yeah, yeah. that was the only one who saw and it. And wasn't it? And the partly it was the collapse of the UKIP vote, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, the collapse of the UKIP vote, I think... The and many went back to Labour. Well, of course they did. How yeah. could the Tories not have grasped that? It's it become... I think in t at times they swallow the propaganda of the... Their own propaganda. Their own propaganda, <laughs> which is that you're, that you're a bunch of fascists. Yeah and that therefore you're somewhere to the right of the Conservative Party, and that therefore anyone who's <coughs> going to stop voting UK will come yeah. back to the Tory party. Which up north, I actually did two opinion polls myself, going out and talking to people. Not scientific. One in your old constituency, Thanet mm. South, yeah. Thanet yeah. South yeah. where I spoke to the, UKIP, the former UKIP voters, this was just before the 2017 election, and said, what way are you going to vote now? And I got a hundred of them, and the overwhelming majority were going back to the Conservative Party. Mm. But the Conservative Party didn't need them. Because they had all those they seats. Did, they were going to win anyway. They were going to win anyway. Yeah. In Hartlepool, where I did it, mm. almost none were going to the Conservative Party. Yeah. They were going to the Labour Party and paradoxically to the Liberal Democrats' protest vote. Mm. You know, they were going anywhere but to the Conservative Party. Yeah. And I thought that they'd, they, they've got this seriously wrong. And then they came out with a, an appalling manifesto um, and Corbyn came out with a good populist left-wing manifesto. And he looked energetic. And he looked energetic. I mean, he was out there, he was doing street events. Oh, and he was a bit like you, Nigel, he's yeah. fought campaigns. Yeah, yeah well, she, he, which she, she'd, she'd never, never been allowed been out that's right, outside that's right. the house. I mean, he'd fought off for yeah. three three years, two years, yeah. you know, these... But here, uh, we are, here we are a couple of years on, and I don't know about you, and of course the pressure of leading a party, the pressure of just what you're expected to do as a party leader, he's looking pretty tired now, isn't he? Yeah, and I think I was inclined, I mean, I, I would never, ever vote Labour with Jeremy Corbyn in charge for a whole bunch of reasons, um, uh, mainly his, his, um, his opposition to almost everything that Britain stands for and his friendship with almost everybody who hates Britain. Um, I think it's a disgrace. But I think over the EU and the referendum, he was rather more principled than most people in his party, and certainly more principled than the PLP, which could see an immediate benefit yeah. in... But he's now been taken hostage. But he's now been taken hostage. So effectively, Labour's, I mean, Labour's official position now is they want a second referendum, yeah. and it's Remain versus some kind of Remain, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where yeah. he's been forced to. That's right. I love, but I love the Emily Thornberry. We'll campaign for a new deal. Put yes. the British I mean, think campaign against it. Against I mean, you couldn't invent that. But, but, you, but these days you could because it's so <laughs> absurd. But I mean, don't forget. I mean, don't forget that this is a great thing. The wonder, the wonder of the momentum supporters suddenly beginning to twig. Corbyn really doesn't like the EU, does he? Mm. And of course he doesn't. I mean, it's as late as 2014 and 2011 that Corbyn was talking about this. this oh, you know, I, mean, he, I mean, listen, he makes me sound quite Europe. He does. In yes. some of those speeches. No, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. 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 Full on and stuff. a couple of the reasons, you know, I voted uh, leave narrowly. You know, I had to think about it an awful lot. Um, partly for Lexit reasons, as they horrible. Yeah, 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 I, I know. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, the European Union run by big businesses, big banks. Yes. Well, and the exploitation of immigrant labour, mm. you know. Mm. Uh, which they've done pretty effectively. Which they've done very effectively. Um, but now must... Well, he's still in charge. And if we have any principle about it, we should insist that he should be in charge. And that if there is a caretaker government, he should be the leader of it. I'm sorry, but you've got to be honest <laughs> about these things. But, but the concept of a caretaker government, the concept that midway through a parliament, without an election, yeah. the colour of the government would change, yes. it's never happened before. Especially, really especially I loved the idea from two weeks ago, because this would just cap it all for me, that Burko would be the Prime Minister. Or the, the President. Son. Or President. <laughs> <laughs> um, they have done everything they possibly can They've used every unelected institution, whether it be the law courts, uh, whether it be the House of Lords. Um, they have done everything they can to stop Brexit. Mm. And that is what they were. That is the only law. There is only one law. And yet, in the midst of all of this, and I'm going to say this, and you can agree or disagree, but in the midst of all of this, but I began, you know, I, I kind of in 2016 was so relieved we'd won. Mm. 
and I'm he, surprised if I'm no I was surprised that night because I got myself I'd mentally prepared yeah. funny enough Donald Trump said the same to me he said when the polls closed I convinced myself I'd lost he said, and you almost it's a bit like it's a bit like waiting for the result of a photo finish mm. you mentally yeah. prepare yourself for the worst yes you do and then if yeah. the right comes along then you're yes. the, 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 you know the right way comes along then you're delighted no I was the day before the referendum I was convinced we'd win the day of the referendum when I saw that poll that came yeah. out at 11 o'clock that morning so about 8% lead say 10% lead, lead and I saw the markets all move and I thought well I know markets can be wrong and polls can be wrong but can they be that wrong the person who published that poll is now in the House of Lords <laughs> which tells you about everything you need to know actually there were two polls um, on that day one of them gave Remain a 6% lead, the other gave Remain a 10% lead. Mm. Um, and I can remember throughout the course, of, people have such short memories. Yeah. Throughout the course of the next two years, if we had a vote again, Remain would win because this poll shows them 2% ahead of the poll. Well, I'm sorry, the eve of the actual poll, it showed them 10% ahead <coughs> and 6% ahead. Yeah. yeah. You know? When will people grasp that? Well, the of well, also you can ask questions in a certain way. You yeah, can reallocate the unknowns. You can do all sorts yeah. of things. But right here we are, and we've got a Labour Party that has broken its promises to the electorate, a Conservative Party that keeps telling us it'll deliver. It doesn't. It didn't under Mrs May. And I'm going to speculate, sitting here with you in the first week of October, uh, that Boris won't deliver either. You know, he's put this amendment. When you say won't deliver, what you well, mean? Well, he's put an amendment forward to the European Union, uh, which has one quite optimistic part of it that he actually states clearly that we ought to leave the customs union, we ought to leave uh, single market rules in 2021 or whenever transition ends. Uh, the EU aren't accepting that. I mean, there's no way they're accepting that. Um, and therefore, Parliament's not accepting it. In my, you know, I, and I, Ireland I, won't accept I, it. And, and I don't think Ireland's going to accept it. Or so I, I think we're in stalemate. And I, you know, all his talk of do or die, we'll leave. The Ben Act is flawed. Well, you know why? I mean, come on, you know why that was? I mean, the first two weeks of Boris, <coughs> forgive me, the first four weeks of Boris were an attempt to crush you. And they still are. And they still are. Yeah. Uh, and the idea was. And actually, as a political strategy, it's not a bad one. If you can out Brexit Farage mm. and the Brexit Party, mm. uh, what they had to do was to get you down to single figures and preferably mm. seven, six, seven percent. Mm. Hasn't happened. It's not working. It's, been, it? it's still you're still yeah, at sticky. fourteen percent. It's yeah. still sticky, um, which is interesting. So, so that kind of failed. But in doing that, of course, I mean politically, he lost allies who he would normally be able to count on. As a one nation Tory. As a one nation Tory. Yeah. Um, so I think it was a flawed strategy. I might have tried to do the same. I thought the first two weeks were fairly impressive. And I think, having seen interviews with you at the time, there was some grudging acknowledgement of that. Oh, I don't grudge if I hear the right <laughs> things. And I know what I'm saying about, look, the fact that he's actually said, I want to leave the customs yeah. union, clearly. Of course I applaud that. The problem I've got with it, Rod, is the withdrawal agreement, the political declaration, this new European treaty structure we're going into, he wants to amend it. It literally is putting lipstick on a pig. And, 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 and actually, I think what we should be saying is, look, this is utterly flawed. Let's just ditch this. It doesn't work at any level. Look, and why don't we go for, if the Prime Minister's objective is a genuine free trade agreement. Why not go for that without all the political attachments? That's my difficulty with it. There's two things, I think. I've, I've had a problem with some leavers in the past who seem to me to be deluded, and they still seem to me to be deluded now. I still have leavers saying to me, but it's all right, we're going to leave with no deal. And uh, they keep saying this, and I say, well, because it's the law, it's a default position. Uh, no, yeah, really, really, happen, this is never going to happen. <coughs> yeah. um, and, I, and I felt slightly the same way and was thus torn before the pig had lipstick on it, mm. when it was Theresa May's pet pig. Mm. Um, and there was that last vote. And the leavers thought it's either May's deal or no deal. Whereas I was arguing to them, no, it's either May's deal or no Brexit. 
Now, I still think that that's true to a degree, because however strong you are as a party, um, under the present <laughs> parliamentary system, electoral system, um, even if there's a general election, I can't see you getting a clean breakthrough. I just cannot see it. I cannot see how you can do it. I mean, I, I defer to you. Well, you, you, well, you, well I, I mean, I mean Ronnie, okay, let me just, before we come back to that. I mean, no one has been more important in, 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 in getting us towards this point than you have. There has been no politician since the Second World War who has had a greater effect upon the country. And for that, you deserve every tiny bit of credit. I still think that, you know, we're fucked. Fine. Okay, I mean, and that's what this book says, right? Yeah. Now, now, it's a good read. I recommend it. I think the way that you chart the campaign, the fact that actually having vote leave and leave dot EU was actually an advantage, not a disadvantage. Yeah. Uh, some of the untruths may be told on both sides. All of that, I think, is brilliant. The way that you analyse uh, the BBC, their unreformability yeah. uh, as they're currently structured, the way, the way you talk about the change of life, all of that's brilliant. Where I struggle with you, Rodley. Yeah. Yep. really struggle with you. Uh, and maybe this is because I'm the perpetual bull trader optimist in all things in life, is that I get the feeling that you really think we're finished and done with Brexit. I do. I do. And I disagree with you. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to try this on you. Go on. Opinion polling, as we've said already, can show you all sorts of different things, and it depends how you do it. Quite consistently now, over the last couple of months, if you give people the binary choice, do you want to leave on the 31st of October? Now, some call it no deal. Of course, in the Brexit party, anybody caught saying no deal is made to wash their mouths out with soap and water because it's a clean break Brexit, which I think has got a more positive ring to it. But, but if you ask people in a binary choice, do you want to just leave on the 31st of October and take what comes? Short-term disruption, whatever, or extend for six months and have a second referendum. You've suddenly got leads now in that binary choice for just getting the hell out, that are consistently over 15%. Equally, if you really pin people down on what their choices are, 35% of the country wants to remain. It's only 35%. No, indeed. Now, it's still, for me, an alarmingly high number, but it's only 35%. You've then got clean break Brexit, gets a tad more than that, and leaving in an orderly fashion with yeah. a deal, yeah. gets another 15%. Yeah. We are yeah. almost looking, I mean, if there was a second referendum. We'd win. We win it by a We'd big, win it by big, a big lump. Lump. depending upon what was written on the and what the question was, and, the question and was. you know, if it was, I mean, if it was Corbyn's referendum, remain or remain. I, I just go down the pub. I wouldn't bother. But but if it was a fair vote, we'd win. So I'm optimistic because but, but that's I, always been the case. We voted to leave. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but we're more yeah. resolute. But here's I, I, I think you're right. That we're more part, resolute. We're more yes. resolute. I think in that's that true than we were. And I think a lot of remainers. I do not know a single remainer personally as a friend, so it's not scientific, but I don't know a single one who doesn't want us to leave now. Because they respect democracy. Because they respect democracy. Yes. And yes. also because they're pigs sick of it. Uh, get, it get it over. Get it over with. Yes. But, but also yes. because they respect democracy, that's what should happen. Now, I think there's only a small tranche of that remain a vote that doesn't think that. Mm. Uh, the 35% does worry me. Um, but I, I, I guess that's what happens when you, when you do opinion but, polls. But when you've got a majority that is settled, Resolute, who and it's quite funny. Some, some of the polling but the now's politicians don't give ha, a on. monkeys. Yeah, yeah, but hang on. Some of the polling now is funny. You said a Brexiteers. Uh, with Brexit, you'll be poorer. Do you care? No. <laughs> I mean, they've reached the point now. You can tell us what you bloody well want. We couldn't care less. And so I think this. I think in the end, if the gap between political parties and the people is that wide, yeah. something comes in and fills the gap. Yeah. And I think in the short term, the Brexit party did do that. I think what we did in those European elections was, well, firstly, get rid of Mrs. May, which was a useful yeah, thing. Yeah, very useful. We reset the political debate and agenda, and we actually got the clean break to be the most popular option, because mm. before that, nobody was really articulating that position. And I think there's a real opportunity. I think just as the Labour You have party, no MPs. Hang on. Just as no, but we're but we're, in, but we're an incredible threat. Yes, you are incredible threat, and I think just as the Labour Party has been on a journey towards becoming fully Remain in every way. Oh, and also pro open borders. I mean, goodness knows the number of breaks from their manifesto a couple of years ago is amazing. But equally, the Conservative Party is on a journey slowly and reluctantly. It is becoming a more Leave party, and I think we reach a point. 
I could be wrong, but I think we reach a point, maybe sooner rather than later, when Johnson and his strategists, when faced with the next general election, realize one thing, they simply cannot win without some accommodation. If they don't think they simply cannot win now, then they never will, because it, it is the height of stupidity to think that, that, that Boris needs to win 50 seats, it, it needs to gain 50 seats. Yep. Where are they coming from? Oh, I just, oh, oh. Just not know where to be seen. A deal with me can give him that. Sorry? A deal with me can give him well, that. Well, I'm not sure it does, but, but we'll come to that in a moment. I mean, look, here's, here, here's how I see an election if it was slightly depends upon what happens with this deal, with Boris's deal, but, but if, it, if it came, uh, if, if this deal went through, which isn't inconceivable, it's possible, possible. I think unlikely. Uh, very unlikely, but yeah. If it went through, you'd stand against him, uh, rightly, and he'd lose. <laughs> and we'd have Corbyn. Um, um, we'd have a, well, beh well, perhaps we'd have a SNP, Liberal yeah. Democrat, yeah, whatever. Be led by yeah. Corbyn. Maybe led by Corbyn. <laughs> led by Corbyn. <laughs> That's the point. Um, maybe, maybe. I don't see that. You maybe. see. Actually, you say that, but in 2015, and you remember this very well, 2015, when I led UKIP, we hurt the Labour vote more than the Tory vote. So this stuff's not, this stuff's it's, not it's easy not, to put it. that simple. No, no it's sure. Um, if, however, there's some sort of agreement, which I keep hearing from sources very close to the Prime Minister uh, is never going to happen, will never happen, it cannot happen. We're going to put Farage back in his box, you remember, back in your box. How's the box? Yeah, that's all right. I, I, know, I haven't been back in it yet. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 as I wrote at the time, instead of putting you back in, uh, in your box, he's, he's actually put you on a plinth, <laughs> and sort of waved the plinth around. Um, <laughs> At least give the enemy something to fire at. <laughs> well, it, yes. What, what I see then for the election, um, you're offering Boris something like, uh, look, we want 90 seats in the north. Whatever it may be. Yeah. Well, let's say he says no to that. Let's, let's, let's assume he changes his mind and comes to 50 or 60. The, 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 and, and you take of those 50 or 60, 30 or 40. Mm -hmm. uh, even then, I don't think you win. I think the Tories are going to suffer a catastrophe in London. A lot of seats there. They still remarkably have a lot of seats there. And this is because it's Remain. And it's Remain. Big demographic change. It wouldn't surprise me massively uh, if the opposition got its act in order that Uxbridge could go. He's got some problems there. He's hasn't got he? some problems. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are a lot of Tory Labour, uh, Tory uh, London MPs who think we're finished. We're finished. I think they'll also lose, in some of the home counties, Liberal redoubts, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, let to the Lib Dems. Let alone Cornwall and places. Let alone like Cornwall to the Lib Dems. So I think they're facing an, Im an immediate loss of seats. Mm. So it doesn't just have 50 to gain, he's got somewhere in the region of 90. To Scotland. And then there's Scotland, <laughs> where they performed admirably last time, yeah. and will not perform admirably this With time. Remain a Ruth at the head. With Remain a Ruth at the head. But a popular figure, policy, yes, uh, policy yes, aside. Yes, yes, but no, never in the world of God is she a Conservative, but there we are, that's a different issue. Um, <laughs> so I just do not see where this majority is going to come from. Well, well he's, 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 he's got a huge opportunity with us if he, if he chooses to take it. You know, we've, we've, as you said, our vote, despite everything they've thrown at us and everything they've tried to do, the indications are that still four and three quarter million people intend to vote for us. If we get to November the 1st, that'll be six and a half million people want to vote for us because they would have failed, because they would have failed to deliver again. Even if Boris has seemed to have tried, the Conservative Party have failed to deliver twice in one year. Oh, yeah. Well, look, I think, I think part of your analysis is right. I also think the analysis that, and I've written this many times before, that Boris doesn't play well in the north of England mm. um, is, is pretty potent and trouble. Mm. I mean, that's where he has to pick up votes. Mm. I mean, the only seats where I can see the Tory party picking up <coughs> uh, in this coming election is the East Midlands and maybe Essex. And then the, they'll have you to contend with their presumably. Well, listen, I've offered them a lifeline. They can take it or not. If they do, 
and even John Curtis, you know, he's pretty well respected. Yeah, I know Curtis is fine. You know, yes. And John says, actually, a grown up deal between Boris and Nigel gets Boris a majority of 40. Yeah, I think he's wrong. I think he's wrong. Um, though he's better than Kellner. <laughs> uh, but I, I think he's wrong. I just don't see it that way. However, you do have to deal with this, which is that vote Brexit, get Corbyn. I mean, there is that. Well, they'll try that, but I. I, I but I'm there's not, some truth in it. I don't know that there is. I think Peterborough. Well, if well, exactly, Peterborough. Well, well all right. Well, there we are. Say vote no, Conservative, oh, get Corbyn. Well, there you are, <laughs> Peterborough. We're the challengers to the Labour Party. Sure. The Conservatives put up a candidate who gets a few percent because he's on the ballot paper, Labour win with 31%. There's the insanity of it. I mean, the logic of what we're saying here is, you mentioned Peterborough, and I'll come back with Bracken. The other by-election we've had for Parliament since the European elections, where the Tories came within a gnats yeah. of the Liberal Democrats, yeah. and in a very weak area for the Brexit Party, we get a double-digit score. So they denied us. We denied well, 27. You know, I mean, it's a grown up game here. No, 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 no. We got, you know, 10% of the vote or whatever it was. Um, uh, so I think there is a grown up game here. And I'm, Rod, I am still bullish. I think the genie is out of the bottle. I think Brexit is going to be delivered. I think the European Union is going into a very, very serious internal turmoil over this economic downturn. Well, I would hope so. That is rapidly coming. Uh, they have no idea with the ECB what more they can do. The ECB is useless. I mean, they're in terrible trouble with all of this. Um, and I, I think Europe's headed for a bad time. I think we're going to get stronger and stronger on Euroscepticism. I think politics at some point will match it. But you still feel... Still, I still have my doubts. I mean, I hope you're right. I hope you're, you're right. Becoming and I, I, you're becoming the Victor Meldrew. Yes, Collins. no, I am. I know you're quite right. You're quite right. Uh, uh, p p perpetual pessimism. Uh, but I do hope you're right. You know, I hope you're right in that, you know, the next government is a... Is a is a is a Boris Farage uh, deal. Um, that would be great because then the Social Democratic Party can get on with filling that void. Well, there you are. Which is a void. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. No, uh, there's, there's loads of room out there. Loads of room out there. And, and Rod, let me just finish with, with one one point. You know, you've come from the BBC. Yeah. You've come from 37 years of the Labour Party. You have stepped up to the Brexit plate in a remarkable way, and you did it during the campaign and you're still fighting very hard for what you believe to be right and you're more more could I say I'm more bothered about unlike you where it's always been let's get us out yeah with me it's the, the it's the it's the dismissal of democracy mm. that's done it. That's, well well that's I think I think I'm there now too I think that's yeah. it, it, it that yeah <coughs> I, I, I said to the audience that this isn't about brexit now it's about a whole it's democratic about democracy. process what how much of a price have you paid in terms of friends, people that you thought you knew? You know, you've stepped outside of your comfort zone in a sense doing this. Yeah, uh, I don't care, but <laughs> I mean, everybody I know in the BBC voted Remain. Everybody, the lot. I, I mean, they all did. They're all on Facebook. Um, you know, you, you won't get spoken to. Uh, you get ignored. But frankly. You know, I couldn't really give a fuck. I don't want to turn into Jess Phillips here. Say, oh, it's been so hard. You wouldn't believe the horrible things that people say to me. You know, I mean, come on. Um, you, you have to stick up for what you believe in. What annoys me, and I know this annoys Brendan O'Neill as well, who's a, who's a good friend, is the right-wing columnist Rod Little. Yeah. <laughs> and Brendan's not right wing. We're from the left. Yeah, yeah. But we're from, but you know, we're from an old working class left, which turned to UKIP and turned to your party. Yeah, yeah. On wow. mass. Uh, so that annoys me. It annoys me as being characterised. It annoys me as being characterised on on programmes as the controversialist. When I'm saying what everybody I know up north thinks. I'm not saying anything different. When I talk about immigration, I think we need to get it down a bit. You know, racist. You know, that, that is the mm. stuff which... But then it bothered me, you know, I mean, you think I've changed. Frankly, when I was in the, on the Today programme, we were doing stuff about this and getting into trouble for it. Um, so, no, I couldn't really give a monkey's in the end. Do you, Nigel, do you? No, not at all. No, I do it because I believe in it. Do you promise you're going to go on doing what you're doing? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. See you, Nigel. Brilliant.